participants, uh, including our members in the chat room. Uh, it's a great uh, pleasure to introduce Dr. Jamie uh, Bazin, Professor of Neurosurgery at the Neurosurgery Medical College, uh, College of Wisconsin. Uh, she is uh, practicing in Milwaukee, and she's a graduate of uh, West Virginia Medical School. And uh, she is, again, a neurosurgeon who practices in complex spine. And uh, it's really great to have her. I've seen her name on so many papers over the years. And here we have her live and uh, looking relaxed and tanned despite a long, uh, grisly uh, uh, winter. So good morning, Jamie, and Hi. thank you for joining us. Hi. Um, I was going to bring up uh, some some papers, uh, let me see PowerPoint. Uh, Here we go. All righty. Um, I would like this to be more interactive and I was gonna say some of the questions I could see in the chat um, were coming up in the talk. So feel free to jump in. Um, the reason I entitled this The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. I think you've seen that from the four cases presented that there's multiple different approaches. And so you've got some flexibility and I was gonna say there's not always one right way. Uh, the bad thing is um, there's more complications with this type of surgery than I think um, most spine surgeons feel comfortable with unless you're doing complex spine. And I was gonna say, as far as ugly, many times these uh, patients present after they already have some spinal cord injuries. So um, I think it's a tough population to deal with. Um, as far as the incidence, we've seen that uh, the incidence is uh, for OPLL is growing. It's higher in the Japanese population as compared to the US, but the, there are papers that I've referenced that show that the incidence is increasing in the US. We've seen that it's a genetic uh, disease and it also has an endocrine component. Um, as far as the primary OPLL goes, um, it's strongly associated with um, HLA. And we've also seen that um, the endocrine factors, it's highly associated with diabetes and obesity. And um, as I say, secondary, we saw the case with the, the renal issue. Um, uh, hypophosphatemia is a uh, common presentation. The majority of these patients um, are going to present with cervical um, myelopathy. Um, about 5% of people with OPLL um, won't have any clinical presentation, so they're sort of the rare bird. Um, the majority of the people will present um, with uh, myelopathy and they tend to progress over time. Um, we've seen the x-rays where we have the continuous form, and I was going to say that the case with the cervical extension down into the thoracic was, um, you know, like what we see with the type A. The um, fragmented is in the, the B, and those are behind the bodies, so I was going to say, again, you know, tougher to get to um, from an anterior approach. The mixed type um, and I was going to say, we saw good examples of that this morning. And then the um, segmental, which is more um, almost mimicking a uh, disc herniation. We've talked, or you guys talked about getting flexion extension. I think that's key because you don't know um, where to stop your construct unless you know the, the motion going on. Um, here, has, again, like you showed some of the... Um, dish or alkalosing along the anterior aspect of the body in conjunction with the um, OPLL posteriorly. I think it's real important. I, I think people tend to get more MRIs now. And I was going to say, I think when you're talking about doing a really big surgery that um, get spend the time and money, get the CAT scan, because I think it's going to help your clinical decision making, um, you know, on the front end. Here's a picture of the uh, pre-op MRI, and this is more of the, the um, segmental type. Um, I was going to say the, the drawing of the K line, um, which you guys touched on, um, to try to maintain the lordosis. Um, one of the things that, that wasn't touched on um, was using the island technique, so we're going to discuss that a little bit later. but. Um, if you are concerned, and particularly with this double layer sign, uh, which you would see with CAT scan, 
Uh, you may have dural involvement. And so about 50% of these people are going to have, uh, you know, invasion of the dura. And sometimes you get lucky and the arachnoid is intact. But I was going to say, um, you know, this is part of what you need to think of when you're, you know, planning out your surgery. Um, when you have just a, a single um, here, you're much less likely to get a CSF leak as compared to the double layer sign. And with, uh, I think what I saw for CSF leak with, you know, with the single component here is typically about um, 14%. And I was gonna say with this double layer sign, it's up to about 50%. We talked about the, the imaging, the flexion extension, the K line. I think it's real important to get swallowing study on the front line or on the front end. Uh, many times these people have swallowing issues and um, because they've lived with it every day, they don't discuss it. And then post-op, um, oh, you know, it must've been from the surgery. So I, I have a low threshold to get a swallowing study uh, before surgery. Um, when you're trying to decide the surgical approach, um, you know, kyphosis, I think, is a big issue in the cervical spine. Um, do you go where the pathology is? Um, you know, clinical presentation, I think, uh, main thing is, you know, we're operating to keep them functional. The other thing about body habitus, um, sometimes you have people who are too obese to um, put prone. And I was going to say, um, if they're losing function, you may be sort of forced to go anteriorly. So again, that's something that you need to think about. You know, you may be able to do the anterior um, early on and then potentially with weight loss, then go back and uh, do the, you know, more definitive procedure posteriorly. Um, I think microscope is, is going to be used um, in all of these cases, or most of them anyway, um, particularly if you're going anteriorly. Um, I tend to use ultrasound, and I was going to say, I think that gives me a fairly good estimate of um, just how much the cord has migrated posteriorly, so I would encourage that. Um, I haven't done much as far as the MRI intraoperative, but I was going to say, when I'm in doubt, I will swing in the um, O-arm and, uh, you know, give it a, a spin to see what's going on with the decompression um, you know, intraoperatively. Um, do you guys use much monitoring there? We, uh, thank you, Jamie, great points. Um, we do use monitoring very extensively. Um, we use obviously baselines and uh, uh, live and breathe hard by the MEP uh, results that the uh, 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 intraoperative monitoring texts give us. Uh, we do use our MAP goals to be 80, 85 plus. Uh, we will incur possibly higher bleeding as much as we try to have best possible hemostasis uh, as a price of having elevated MAPs a priori. Uh, we do use optimized uh, perfusion um, systems nowadays to try to look at systemic vascular resistance to make sure that the patients are adequately resuscitated prior to the decompression part to so put instrumentation in first and then do the lift off and try to do the lift off very atraumatically. So not yanking off the lamina to avoid pulling on the cord. And finally, I personally, this is a personal preference of mine. Uh, so maybe you, you can shoot me down for that. I still use the NASCIS two steroids a priori because in my experience, this gives me the best reassurance that the membranes are stable as I'm, uh, whether like it or not, somewhat traumatizing the cords during the decompression. My biggest fear is the reperfusion trauma as the cord kind of has a new uh, kind of a blood flow challenge or scenario. Any thoughts on steroids? Any thoughts on reperfusion trauma? Um, reperfusion trauma is real. Um, <laughs> Uh, as far as steroids go, I, I think um, it's sort of a knee-jerk reaction for, for surgeons to go towards the steroids. Um, I think, you know, the short course, I don't think it's a big issue, and I think it also helps with, um, you know, pulmonary stuff afterwards. So I, I have a low threshold to use steroids. I don't use, you know, the, the previous protocol that we used with the trials and stuff. Um, what about lumbar drains? preoperatively. That used to be something that was in vogue. And frankly, I quit doing it because I probably forgot about it. But I was going to say, 
that was something that people used to do. Um, and I was going to say they do do it with thoracic surgery. Um, so Brian Kwan's research on uh, improved cord perfusion with uh, CSF drainages. Uh, well noted it's very experimental still and again intentionally i would never want to do that i've just not used it and again we uh, are asked to do a lot of opll surgeries here in our area um so no lumbar drains are not used by i think i'm looking at my partners here any of us on a routine elective basis and uh, for the cervical spine again i used to do a, a number of them anteriorly and again the csf leaks this has been in the chat room uh, quite a bit um, anterior uh, CSF leaks are not a trivial matter, so I think you're going to talk about that. But again, there I think I remember one patient where I had to put a lumbar drain in after a anterior CSF leak uh, with uh, dural erosion. But uh, I rarely, if ever, have to use a lumbar drain. Perfect. So, all righty, moving on. Um, here, I think we've discussed most of the different approaches as far as. Uh, anterior discectomy with resection of OPLL. Um, I'm going to say we didn't have, I think, much in the way of corpectomies. I, I do mention the floating island technique because I was going to say you can leave, um, you know, areas that um, are are able to float during the the you know after the decompression and. I was going to say, usually you'll get a little bit of bleeding along the side, you know, when you start to dis uh, to disconnect them laterally. Um, but I was going to say, frequently the, the floating islands seem to actually get smaller over time, um, even though there is a tendency for OPLL to progress. I haven't seen like coalescence of the floating islands, and hopefully I'm not leaving too many of them, but it is something to consider that it is okay to leave them. Um, Jimmy, we can did. I ask you about yes. the floating islands, please? So again, intraoperative uh, 3D CT scans with whatever manufacturer you use is one way, but you mentioned your use of uh, ultrasound. Can you discuss the use of an ultrasound when you leave kind of a ossification on the dura behind? Can you see the cord floating away as nicely as if you are down to true dura or whatever's left of uh, arachnoid? Um, I was gonna say, I don't do laminoplasties um, very often. And I was going to say, when I do a wide laminectomy, I am able to, when I bring in the ultrasound, um, see the pulsations of the cord and then anteriorly see, you know, if I've, if I've done the front first, I can see, you know, what residuals, you know, are left. Um, if I'm going posteriorly, then I frequently will make the decision, you know, do I need to go anteriorly based on, you know, the ultrasound. So one, one thing uh, that I've kind of found very helpful, and this is just empirical, if I go posteriorly first and do a wide decompression infusion and get a CT, in the very few cases that I remember now, and maybe I just have selective memory loss here, um, it was a world of difference to do an anterior surgery after a posterior decompression infusion. This just, uh, the, the cord has kind of, uh, uh, lost that pressure of it, uh, the, the tension on the cord and the dural yes. there, and I feel far more comfortable with a fine diamond uh, tip drill to drill away and thin out that anterior bone. Uh, it just seems to be far less of a uh, high anxiety surgery when I've had a established posterior decompression fusion. Is that just my anecdotal experience or do you share that? Uh, no, I, I tend to go posterior first, um, do my ultrasound, Make the you know if there's still compression anteriorly, sometimes I'm able to do less surgery anteriorly. But I was going to say I, I always typically go posterior first and then the anterior. We have agreement. That's awesome. Um, <laughs> so this was the good. Show us the not so good. Okay, moving on to the ugly. Uh, actually, this will be the bad. So dysphonia with the higher um, higher levels, more commonly seen up at like C two three. The dysphagia, um, I was going to say, some of it is, is if you have ossification on the front end uh, or along the anterior longitudinal ligament, um, using, I think, more cautery uh, along the, the anterior aspect of the neck, I think, tends to cause more swelling, um, prolonged cervical retraction. So I tend to drop the retractors every hour. So if if I have a scrub tech that will remind me, because sometimes you get so into it, you, you lose track of time. 
but you know, I've had the scrub tech tell me, okay, you've been in an hour and I'll relax the retractors a bit, let things reproduce, you know, move to a different area and then, you know, move back. Um, as I say, dural tears, um, always ugly from the anterior aspect. Um, I was gonna say, I, you know, I hear people like Rick Sasso, oh, I never have trouble with them. Well, I've had trouble with them. And every now and then, you know, you have to resort to either lumbar drains posteriorly and on a rare occasion, um, even a lumboperitoneal shunt if, if things are really having a hard time healing. The, the C5 palsy is real. And, you know, I think all surgeons, um, you know, at the end of the case, you make sure they're moving everything, but C5 tends to sneak into people even um, as late as two weeks after. And I was going to say most commonly it, it shows up about three days after. So, you know, even though you uh, are patting yourself on the back after the case, realize that C5 may be there the next day when you round. Um, the, these patients may also present with spinal cord injury. Um, we have talked about the post-operative OPLL progression, and I think you know, you're not changing the, the genetics um, or the endocrine disorders with the surgery, but I was going to say it does seem that um, doing fusion tends to slow down the progression. And even though you've given these patients, you know, a good surgery, um, the, the chronic cord compression, you know, still is a gift that can keep, keep giving. So I have pulled some papers that have been in, out in the last couple of years. The complication rate for OPLL, they're giving around 21.5%, so that's significant. The highest complication rate was with the uh, anterior, posterior, and I was going to say that number seems really high to me, but I was going to say, I don't think I would be doing them if that was that high, but um, I was going to say they saw the least um, complications with the posterior decompression alone. I think you have to look at, you know, this over time, because I think if you go with a posterior decompression alone, um, you're more likely to come back um, later on if, if they do develop kyphosis. The number one complication was pulmonary issues, how long you have these people on the table. And I was going to say, I think having a good, I'm going to say aggressive pulmonary care post-op is huge. Um, try to get them up and get them moving. Um, the incidence of, of durotomy around 23%. Um, this paper mentions about neurologic complications and cervical spine related. And I was gonna say this, the difference between the two, I think is that they're, they're mentioning more, I think the dysphagia piece um, as far as being cervical spine related. And they do note that OPLL is significantly you know, more surgical cases between 2003 and 2014. So um, on the, the C5 palsy for OPLL, um, the first paper was a, a large meta-analysis. They found a higher incidence in posterior approaches, males in OPLL. Um, and I was gonna say OPLL tends to be higher in males. Um, and I was gonna say, you know, more procedures are probably done posterior, so there's there's no big surprise there. Um, you mentioned earlier about the, the doing a generous foraminotomy at the four or five level. Um, I, I think you know the fact that you do that on the front end gives you some peace of mind postoperatively, but you saw that it didn't change things. Um, if if somebody woke up with a C5 palsy would you necessarily take them back or would you try to ride it out? Great question. I have an inconsistent answer. I get a post-operative <laughs> CT pretty routinely on the patients. Um, I use a three millimeter ball probe to make sure I have a wide foraminotomy. Uh, We've actually taken one or two patients back uh, that I got involved with afterwards where there was a clear persistent foraminal de uh, uh, presence. But if it's an incomplete or especially a post-primary 
uh, weakness, I usually ride it out. I will get an EMG at the three week mark. And um, I then hope that everything starts getting better. And as you said, the, the uh, track record is usually a benign one, uh, but uh, it's inconsistent still. Uh, we did look at this as a large scale database review in the Global Spine Journal with AO Spine. And we did find that 80 to 95% actually get better, uh, but it may take about half a year to a year. Uh, but an EMG does have a prognostic value in terms of reassuring re innovation or not. If a patient has a profound, complete absence of a C5 palsy and I see an obstruction there, I would vote for uh, having a low threshold to returning the patient back to the OR and just literally doing a almost facetectomy at that level to dig that nerve out. It makes me feel better, uh, yes. but um, <laughs> uh, the, the natural course history may do what it wants to do. Uh, but picking it up uh, is, a, is a big deal. And uh, as an orthopedic surgeon, what I fe frequently see not being done is uh, patients should have a shoulder arm sling because what you don't want to have happen is that the humeral head basically subluxes out of the uh, shoulder and becomes a hanging shoulder syndrome. And that actually puts more pressure or pull onto the uh, brachial plexus and it creates a secondary shoulder pathology. So Supporting that shoulder and patients who don't have a deltoid tone uh, with a shoulder arm sling, I think, is an important adjuvant. Um, I was going to say the, the next paper um, was talking about just overall postoperative nerve injuries and cervical spine. C5 tends to be the more common one. Um, they also mentioned about the difficulty uh, in Parsonage Turner syndrome. And I was going to say because the C5 tends to uh, crop up after the surgery, it's difficult um, in, I was going to say, similar innervation, whether it's a C5 palsy or potentially a Parsonage Turner that's uh, presenting in a delayed fashion. Uh, the incidence of postoperative C8T1 is about 6%, and I was going to say, Horner syndrome, uh, the incidence is small, but, you know, nonetheless real. So that, that can be frustrating for patients, but I was going to say, um, that also seems to get better uh, by itself. So there are uh, two other papers that I pulled. Um, the risk of uh, spinal cord injury um, as compared to uh, with OPLL. Uh, cervical spondylotic myelopathy with OPLL was uh, 4.11 uh, per 100,000. And I'm going to say with uh, people without... Uh, OPLL, I think I did my slide wrong. Um, it was less, about 3.69. Um, there was, uh, you know, people say, you know, should I bother operating if they already have a cord injury? And I was going to say there's good studies that show that even with uh, an incomplete spinal cord injury, um, people still show improvement on the Asia motor scale. Um, you know, they if they come in with uh, Asia motor, uh, in the 66 range, um, you got a significant improvement um, at follow-up up to 91%. So I think if somebody's incomplete, certainly give them the benefit of the doubt um, if, if they, you know, if you feel they can tolerate the surgery. Uh, one of the things that we had talked uh, earlier about was the progression of uh, OPLL and it does seem to progress. Uh, there have been some questions you know, are we operating younger and is the progression just a natural history of the disease? Um, is it more common to progress if it's a multi-level type uh, or a mixed continuous type? Uh, it does seem to be that when, when these do recur that they uh, tend to, um, I wanna say progress on the uh, longitudinal line rather than a depth um, uh, deposition of uh, osteophyte. And there also appears to be the dynamic component. So it appears to progress more after laminoplasty than uh, fusion procedures. So have you seen any difference as far as the, the depth of um, OPLL? Because I think the depth, you know, once you've done your decompression from behind, there's not much else you can do short of going from the front. So. Again, I've in my, uh, and this is again entirely uh, anecdotal, uh, but I deal with this problem quite a lot. Uh, I've just not seen them progress very badly. Uh, I think the longitudinal creep is definitely a factor, and this is why I personally usually will fuse one or two levels above the main disease just to get the cord to fall away, but also arrest that kind of a 
micro instability that seems to activate this uh, tissue metaplasia into a bony domain. So those are my thoughts. And I'm going to say the natural history of uh, cervical spondylotic myelopathy with uh, OPLL, 60% canal compromised by OPLL, uh, the laterally deviated ossification pattern. And I was going to say, I think that that may be what tends to tether some of the roots, particularly in the cervical spine. We mentioned about previously about the dynamic component. There's a higher range of motion in pe people with uh, myelopathy. Uh, OPLL that are myelopathy free um, at uh, 30 years is about 70%. 10% uh, OPLL myelopathy untreated progress. So that 10% number that was in this paper seems to me uh, to be very low. Other papers that I saw um, were more in the 60% range. So I, I tend to have a low threshold to operate on these people. I would rather get them when they're functional and try to maintain function. And I've got some references in there, so. Great talk. So, Jamie, thank you so much. We've had a lot of interest in this subject, um, and I thought it was very clear uh, from your talk, again, confirming my own suspicion. So, uh, observer bias, I guess, um, uh, in terms of uh, fusing these patients does better, and I think we also both agreed um, that posterior first is better for the cervical spine and then anterior as needed. What I'm still perplexed by, and you said that in the beginning, is this seems to be a growing disease problem, and age alone can't be the explanation for that. Initially, we thought this was largely in the Pacific uh, Island nations or in, a, in an Asian population, but I've seen plenty of patients who have no known uh, Asian uh, background. Why, what's going on? So as you looked at this, this i seen very complex studies from Japan looking at all sorts of molecular and genetic aspects and still very confusing to me. Is this an inflammatory disease? What is the HLA uh, um, uh, connection? And why is this a, quote, growing problem? Um, I, I think the HLA stuff is uh, still early. And I was going to say there's so many factors, I think, um, you know, you have the association of HLA and, and DISH also. So I think that, you know, obviously that um, piece of genetics hasn't been sorted out. Um, as far as uh, an inflammatory process, you know, we initially try to fuse. And so, you know, you tend not to use anti-inflammatories when you're trying to fuse, but I was gonna say, is this something that we need to be starting anti-inflammatory, say at six months? You know, once we've gotten our actual construct solid or relatively solid, say, you know, between the three to six months range, once you've, you know, gotten bone formation, um, should we be adding in anti-inflammatories to try to slow the progression down overall? Something I think, you know, should be looked at. Yeah, our, I've tried to send some of those patients to our rheumatologists. We have some excellent rheumatologists. They're so completely overworked that they did not show an exuberant interest in uh, adding OPLL patients to their practices. So I've kind of given up on that. I think this is a very compelling argument to think about some uh, uh, some low impact uh, diseases. Uh, Dr. Dekutowski again um, uh, is raising the issue, and I thought this is very compelling. Uh, that DISH, again, a closely correlated uh, disease, is an environmental dietary activation of circulating osteoblasts. Um, uh, Sundeep Kozla, again, uh, published on that. So dietary activation, uh, that's an interesting aspect because clearly this is an inflammatory disease, clearly that it targets uh, a ligament almost selectively, mm -hmm. not always, is uh, just a very unique thing. And having some stress strain activation seems to also be very clear as we look at the radiographic disease pattern. Uh, so any thoughts on dietary changes in these patients? Any thoughts on uh, being more consistent with exploring inflammatory markers on these patients? I think 10 years from now, inflammatory markers is, is going to be huge. Um, I, I was going to say behaviorally trying to get people to make diet changes. Good luck to you. <laughs> so, but I, I was going to say, I think, um, you know, the inflammatory markers, I think, will, will guide medication, you know, down the road.
Yeah, and I thought this is a great talk. Uh, really appreciate you bringing this up. This is such a recurrent problem with so many unanswered questions, but I thought uh, it was compelling. And I, although some colleagues still thought decompression only through anterior or posterior procedures uh, is possible, I thought that we actually had a pretty good consensus overall also in the chat room on uh, what to do, where, and how. And uh, uh, basically increasing the awareness and maybe even starting databases to try to differentiate DISH, OPLL, OALL, and uh, coming up with greater conformity in terms of how to classify them. I thought that Chinese classification actually made a lot of intuitive sense to me, cervical, thoracic, uh, and uh, diffuse disease. Uh, so I thought this was a really uh, compelling review. Any final parting thoughts for all of us? Um, be patient. <laughs> I was going to say, this is not a surgery that you're going to blow through fast. So just don't don't try to double book these in. Just, uh, one, one more question by Gregor. Be patient. What, one more question. As you said, patient. Gregor just typed in uh, acute spinal cord injury with OPLL, urgent surgery, yes or no. So we showed the case of that pastor where we kind of waited to have a central cord type syndrome. Uh, wait or be patient in those patients also? I was going to say that particular patient, if I remember right, had, I think, four major comorbidities. He had had, um, I think, a cabbage, he had diabetes, he had renal disease, and there was one other. So I think you've got to get your ducks in a row, particularly, and if I remember right, that guy, I think, was 78 or something. So in, in somebody with that many comorbidities, I, you know, I, I'm a little bit hesitant to just go cavalierly into the OR, but I was going to say, get your ducks in a row and then go. Great. I fully agree. Thank our many friends and interested uh, colleagues uh, for all their participation, their interest in our program, and uh, their live comments. Uh, really appreciate all of you together. And Jamie, thank you so much. Great to Thanks. see you. Thanks. It was you fun. Online. Thank you. Appreciate you. Take, take mm -hmm. care. Bye-bye.